Welcome to Mysteries and Mimosas. My name is Max Sterling, and I'm here with my very pleasant co-host, Arya Sterling. Hi, everyone. Well, hello to you, Arya. Man, you're just all smiles over there. I love it. Aren't you? Yeah. Just a big ball of sunshine. Sure. A little bit. All right. Well, how do you want to kick today's episode off? This is your episode. I know it is. Thank you for recognizing that it's mine. It's all mine. So when it's bad, it'll be mine. And when it's good, it'll be yours. Is that how this works? No. No, it's not at all. Okay. Well, I'm going to start off. I'm taking back over control over the uh, trivia. I hope you're okay with that. I've got some trivia questions here for you. This is from the year 2020. Ooh, recent. Super recent. So we'll start off. What do you, what is 2020 known for? COVID. Oh, God. Everybody <laughs> hates COVID. Yep. So the first question I have for you, is COVID related? So I'm going to ask you, and, and just keep in mind, the only reason I'm doing this is because it is the year of the COVID. When was the first case of COVID-19 reported? In the United States or anywhere? In the United States. Hmm. When was it? Yeah. So I'll give you some options would, here. Oh, you want okay. some options? Yeah. Okay. So I'm being nice to you. Mm-hmm. Is it A, December of 2019, B, November of 2019, C, late October, that's oddly specific, of 2019, or January of 2020? Hmm. I'm going to go with either December or January. I'll go December. You're going to go December? Yeah. Oh, uh, look at you winning. Oh. Winning. Wow, look. Yeah, I'm already... so proud of you. I knew you were going to rock it today. There's only two questions left. All right. All right. Let's go. I don't really have a lot of faith in you because Jeez. on this question, I don't. I'm sorry. Rude. I hope you get it right, though. I'm rooting for you. Which movie in 2020 went, uh, sorry, won Best Picture at the 2020 Oscars? I got four options if you need them. No, oh, I'll need them. <laughs> a, Green Book. B, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. C, 1917. Or D, Parasite. Hmm. I'm going to go with either Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or 1917. Okay, what's your final answer? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I mean, that was a great movie, wasn't it? It was good, actually. I really liked it. Yeah. The, the, t- the twist at the end, I don't want to give any spoilers. If you haven't seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you need to see it. Yeah. I, I loved that movie. It was really good. Had a great um, ending that I didn't expect. But no, you were wrong. It's oh. actually Parasite. Never oh, heard of I've it. I've never even heard of that. <laughs> but if it won Best Picture at the 2020 Oscars, it's now on my list. Yeah, we, sure. maybe we should look it up. Let's do it. Right now or later? No, <laughs> later. Later, okay. <laughs> Final question. Oh, man, you're one for one. I actually think you'll get this one. Who performed at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show? I can give you four options if you need them. You really shouldn't need them. Was that the Eminem and... No. No? Oh. No. Do you need options? Yes. Was it Lady Gaga? Oh, was it... um... Oh, geez. Hold on. Shakira and J-Lo. Goodness gracious. Was it you or You got no? it right. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you I didn't even need that. options. No. Yeah, you know, because these hips don't lie. Wow. Yeah. You, ha- you had to say I it. I had to say it. Oh, um, this podcast does not lie. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, so do you have a mimosa recipe for us? I do. Well, what do you got? Today's mimosa is a pink lemonade mimosa. It has pink lemonade, champagne, and a lemon twist on top. This is the, um, this would be good in the dragon glassware Barbie glasses. Anyway, so today's case is Nakota Blake Kelly. This is super sad, actually. Um, you know, it, it definitely has a special place in my heart because it is a child and it's a very unfortunate circumstance, but let's get into it. In December of 2008, Haley Kelly went on her first date with a guy named Miguel Encama. At the time, Kelly was a single mother raising her two-year-old daughter, Jasmine. But what Haley didn't know at that time was that Miguel Nakoma was a man living a life full of lies and manipulation. 
In fact, Miguel was one of five different names used by this man, um, who we know now as Anthony uh, Dibia. Although we know, now know him as Anthony Dibia, Anthony was born in Nigeria in 1983, and he was born with the birth name Ejike Ibe. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So in 2002, when uh, Anthony was 19 years old, or Ejike, but we'll call him Anthony, um, he arrived in the United States illegally from Nigeria using a fake name. And upon his arrival to the United States, he began living with a Nigerian family in North Carolina. Hmm. So he already, you know, had a pretty interesting start. Yeah. Because it, to his, you know, his life in the United States because he, he came here under, um, you know, the false pretenses, a lie. In right. Fact. In an effort to repay the North Carolina family for their hospitality, Anthony moved to Indiana, during which time Anthony assumed the identity of that family's teenage son. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Let, jerk, me, uh, let me help you out. Let me repay you for letting me live with you. Yeah. Jeez. Thanks for, you know, housing me, probably feeding me and getting me on my feet. Yeah. I'm going to take your kid's identity. So what he did with that teenager's information was he attended college. He took out student loans in that kid's name. Um, he used that teenager's information to file tax returns, oh probably gosh. getting tax refunds and everything else. So, yeah. That poor kid's going to have a hard time ever establishing, um, like, credit and stuff. Well, no, probably not. I mean, this happened when he was a teenager, and, you know, eventually he I'm sure that he bounced back from that. You know, Still, though, like he shouldn't have even had to start out that way. He should, yeah, exactly. He shouldn't have had to start out that way. So when Anthony began dating Haley in 2008, uh, Anthony was using one of his fake names. In fact, Anthony continued using a fake name throughout their relationship, even after Haley became pregnant and gave birth to their son by the name of Nakota, who this episode's about, Nakota Kelly. In fact, it wasn't until Nakota was about 18 months old that Haley le learned Anthony's real name. Jeez. Yeah. So, she, so you terrible. know, immediately their relationship is built on lies. And she doesn't know Anthony's real name, which I don't even know if Anthony is his real name at this point. Um, it's not his birth name, but this is what he now goes by. It's his legal U.S. name. Hmm. And she doesn't even know that that's his name until, you know, their son's a year and a half old. Yeah. Wow. So, not a very trustworthy dude. Not at all. And they were still together at that time. Yeah, at that time she they were. And, yeah. Okay. Um, in 2011, one of Anthony's identity theft victims, maybe maybe the teenage son, I'm not really sure, uh, made a report to the police leading to Anthony's arrest uh, for identity theft and stuff. As a result, Anthony was charged and convicted of several identity theft and fraud related crimes. He was sentenced to 34 months and he served that time in a federal prison. Wow. Yeah, there was also a charge with something about um, using illegal documents to enter the United States, something like that. But either way, they were all identity theft and fraud-related crimes, and he served that 34-month sentence in the federal prison. Interesting. Yeah. I, I wonder why they didn't just deport him right away when they found out he was well, here illegally. they actually did try to deport him. Um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, they tried to deport Anthony back to Nigeria, but... And I don't know how this works. Nigeria refused to take him. Wow. They're just like, he's, he's your issue now. Yeah. We're not, he's not allowed back over here in our country. Yeah, they're probably, they're probably like, uh, yeah, we don't want any of our citizens to be a victim of identity theft or anything else for that matter. So right. you keep him. Wow. So after Anthony was found guilty, he wrote a letter to the judge, which he provided at sentencing and asked the judge for leniency. He begged the judge for another chance to start over for his family's sake. He specifically pulled at the judge's heartstrings by asking the judge to consider his kids growing up without a father. So, but regardless, he was still given that 34-month sentence. Hmm. So by kids, is he talking about Haley's daughter, Jasmine? Yeah, as, yeah that's... Okay. That's what I, uh, yeah, there's nothing to, you know, out there to indicate that he had any other kids. I mean, it's, you know, he had Nakota. He probably already referred to Jasmine as his own because he was in a relationship with Haley. Okay. So, but either way, I mean, he's, you know, you see that quite often where people show remorse or they 
and maybe you could talk about this a little bit more doing what you do, but I think that sometimes judges and caseworkers, um, probation officers, parole officers, things of that, things of those, you know, people in those positions, uh, they can kind of see through those fake, um, feelings of remorse and, you know, begging for those second chances. Yeah. Or, you know, saying you're sorry when you think it's going to benefit you in some way and you're not truly remorseful or you, you, or you are, but you're remorseful only you because you regret being caught for it, not because you truly feel badly for what you've done. There's and, a difference. And so can you kind of tell the difference when you're, you know, cause I know that you've worked a lot with um, offenders who give apology letters to victims. Is it pretty easy to distinguish the difference between someone who is truly remorseful and feels bad for their actions versus somebody who is trying to use that as a, benefit to them for maybe an early release or or something that would help them generally yes and and I say that because I have worked with you know people who have caused harm I've worked on that side of the system for a very long time so I can read people pretty well um, and I think that's benefited me in working you know in doing what I do now because I am typically able to see that to see genuine remorse versus this is a good time for me to do this because it's hopefully going to benefit me in some way. Yeah. So can you maybe give me an example of somebody who like of, of, you know, a letter, for example, that maybe an offender writes to a victim, which would be, I don't know how to say it, I guess, disingenuous. Well, I mean, a a big red flag is to for them when they ask for support, like at an upcoming hearing or something like that, when they actually ask for that in a letter that's intended to provide the victim and their families with a sincere apology. So for when they're asking for something in that letter, it's kind that of a to big me, red flag. Yeah, because you're literally taking this is an avenue for you to genuinely show your remorse to someone, to genuinely tell them this was a terrible decision I made and, and I'm truly sorry for it. And I really have made changes to who I am and the way that I think and process things. Now I'm using this to ask you for something. That's not a genuine way to tell somebody you're sorry. So if you see through it in what you do, Judges see these things quite often, you know, for, you know, mitigating um, factors at sentencing. They, they probably can see through that, too, sometimes. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's the case here, but, it, it, you know, it sure is worth mentioning that it is something to consider. Yeah. You know, is he genuinely sorry for victimizing these people and taking their identity? And like you said, this teenager has to start completely over. Or, or not completely over, but has a rough start from the get-go because of his selfless actions. Right, exactly. Something that he didn't have anything to do with, probably. I mean, his parents made the decision to, you know, allow this guy to live with yeah, them, to try to help him. them. Yeah, and this poor kid who had nothing to do with any of it is now victimized because of it. So, yeah, it's a sad situation all the way around. But, I mean, you have people, and, and I don't know because I don't know Anthony personally, but just from the sounds of it, he sounds like a pretty, like a pretty good manipulator, master manipulator. So, you know, who who knows if he's, you know, different names. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's, you know, who knows, maybe probably he's, you know, trying to manipulate the judge too. So yeah, I I do think he's a master manipulator for sure. In fact, when he was serving his prison sentence, he continued to stay in contact with Haley. He was writing her letters, asking her to put money on his books and basically just continuing to, beg Haley for forgiveness. Um, and so you, you see a lot of times when you have inmates, you know, in a, in a prison, for example, they are very good at manipulating people on the outside, whether it's loved ones to give them money or new people, uh, you know, pen pals that they meet. I've seen sometimes when people go, I don't know, when, when people meet inmates as a pen pal, They'll, they'll have these inmates calling their kids, you know, their own kids, having their kids call these inmates dad. 
I watched, and they don't even know who they are. I watched a, I don't know, some like, I don't true crime documentary where this woman, she was like a church going woman, married, um, but her church was involved with being pen pals for inmates in like the local prison. And so she started writing a man in prison letters and yeah, he manipulated her to the point where she helped him escape and everything. Like, yeah, it's like she, well, she this it, was a woman happen? that she, I mean, like she's married, like very super religious and very loyal. And then all of a sudden she starts writing this inmate to, you know, her heart was in the right place when she was doing it. She was, she thought she was, you know, helping this person. And all the while he was manipulating her in these letters. Eventually she thought she fell in love with him and then he convinced her to help him escape and she did and i mean so that's the level of manipulation isn't, that people isn't can that have that crazy yeah wasn't there something just recently where a female like lieutenant or captain or something yeah a, she was like jail. over the entire jail is it, it the same one it is from alabama i think and, yeah, and they and went then, on the run yep. all the way up they went north and ended up getting in a high speed chase yep. and, yeah it, that's crazy yeah so yeah so not only was he you know, begging for forgiveness and trying to manipulate the judge, in my opinion. Um, he was also doing the same thing, like I said, with the letters to Haley, asking for forgiveness, trying to, you know, keep this relationship together. So he has this, like, kind of similar pattern of behavior. Yeah, I mean, when someone... Okay, so he's been with Haley for... I mean, a while now. They have a child together who's now 18 months old, yeah, at least. Yeah, I think when he, was, when he was released from prison, I think Nakota was seven. Okay, so they've been together for quite a few years at this point, or at least there's been a relationship there, whatever, however rocky it was. Yes, they've known each other for a long time. And he has manipulated her this entire time. He started out by lying to her about who he even was at the beginning he's not even here in the united states legally he used false information to come here then he took advantage of the people who tried to help him right and he, now he's stolen like five people's identities and and he's lied to Haley the whole time they've been together about who he is and now he's begging her for forgiveness so as a when you do that to a victim so He's taken all control away from Haley this whole time. She she doesn't know what's going on. He's controlling the entire situation. He's manipulating her. And then he has the the gall to ask her for forgiveness. So And to put money on his books. Yeah. When when you take so that when you're victimized, when when you're a victim or you know, I know some victims don't don't like to be called victims. They like to be called survivors, which is fine too. But when you victimize someone, you take control away from that person, How, however you victimize them. I mean, it could be this situation that we have here where he's lying to her, he's taking advantage of her, he's, you know, using all these people's identities, all the way to, you know, someone who sexually assaults someone. Wh whatever the case is, when, when you victimize someone, you take the control away from that person. And so if that person ever wants to offer forgiveness or feels that it's something that they want to do for themselves, it should be up to them. Not the, the defender. No, the person who caused the harm should never be asking for that because you've already taken enough away. Forgiveness is something that needs to be offered to you when the person that you've harmed is ready to say, I'm, I want to forgive you because forgiving you will allow me to move forward. And this is this is my path forward is to offer you forgiveness, not the other way around. They don't that person that you've harmed does not owe that to you. And so you should not ask for that. It should be offered saying, to you yeah. when when that person is ready to offer it. So I'm just saying that just goes into who who he is as a person. He he wants her to to forgive him so that he, you know, he can go back living with her and and who knows? I I don't know if he was using her for, I, I don't know. I can't speculate on that. But for whatever reason, he, he's he's trying to weasel his way back into her life so that he can continue to have that control and manipulation over someone. Well, you know what? Good for Haley, because obviously it didn't work. Um, Haley didn't take Anthony back when he was released from prison. Instead, 
Haley separated from Anthony and tried to move on with her life. However, because Haley and Anthony had Nakota together, Anthony was given partial custody of Nakota. Obviously. Of, of right? course. Yeah, I mean, that's he's his the child. Bio dad. Yeah. During that time, Anthony was living in Indianapolis and Haley was living in Wabash, Indiana. Nakota was living primarily with Haley most of the time and only living with Anthony every other weekend in um, Anthony's Indianapolis apartment. Okay. So he had him every other weekend. Do you know how far apart those cities are? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I can look, but I know that it's it's a significant distance. Wabash is north, I believe, northeast of Indianapolis. But let me see. I'll pull up the map right now. Okay. Stand by for excellence. Wow. Yeah, you like that? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody from work always says that, and I, I always like roll it. my eyes like, get out of it here. It reminds me of... Uh, what does he say on, is it on, um, Talladega nights when he's like, I piss excellence. Yeah, maybe (laughs) (laughs) that that sounds about right. Let's see. I'm going to go from Wabash to Indianapolis. Wabash, Indiana is 84 miles Northeast of Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay. So a little bit of a drive. I just, I was curious. It takes, um, about two hours to get there. Um, and so what was I talking about? I forgot. Oh yeah. So Nakota was living with Haley most of the time in Wabash and only every other weekend with, um, Anthony in his apartment in Indianapolis, which is almost two hours away. Okay. So they had a little bit of a commute and a little bit of a distance to co-parent Nakota. Sure. And they probably met in the middle, I assume, or something. Yeah. Whatever the, maybe the court order said, you know, um, who knows? Um, During the time Haley and Anthony were co-parenting Nakota, Haley made four separate allegations of abuse or neglect to the Department of Child Services, or DHS in some states. Hmm. Haley reported allegations of physical abuse, verbal abuse, and she even reported seeing visible injuries on Nakota in the form of light bruises. Hmm. So I I do want to speak about this because, you know, since... Everything happened that we're about to talk about. Haley has filed a lawsuit on the Department of uh, Child Services because um, she's essentially alleging that they failed to act. So with that, number one, child services typically will only get involved and take children if there's extreme circumstances in that it doesn't necessarily have to be a substantiated claim of abuse, but if there's anything in their investigation to indicate that the child is in danger for, of staying there, um, they can implement safety plans. They can remove, with the court's help, uh, children to put them in foster parenting. Or, in this case, they could have, you know, if they substantiated any of these claims of abuse or neglect, they could have restricted the parenting or you know, had a had a temporary parenting plan to give custody, full custody um, via the courts to um, to Haley until she was able to file a motion to restrict those parent, you know, the parenting time, and until it gets seen before a judge, so that Haley can basically make her case. But sure. anyway, it, it's it's probably you know varies from state to state, but that's essentially what would have happened. If those claims were substantiated, that safety plan would have been implemented. So it's, yeah, and I'm sure you're going to, that's probably what you're going to talk about next, but it, it's actually, it's, it's a difficult job to work in child service, well, uh, human services. I work with, um, caseworkers of department of human services on a daily basis, and they do have a very difficult job. They have time frames that they have to meet. Whereas a criminal investigation I really don't have any time frames. I'm going to have a statute of limitations, but I can work my criminal investigation at my own pace and prioritize my cases. Whereas DHS workers or child protective services, they have timelines that they have to meet. They have to talk to children. They have to visit the home. They have to do these things in a certain amount of time. And as you can imagine, they're not just working one case. They're like criminal investigators where they're working multiple cases. And that's what I was going to say. I I think we can all agree that we've definitely seen failures in the Department of Human Services system. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. But I, I don't believe that any of those individuals go into that line of work to ever cause harm. What I think happens is that the system is 
way overburdened. They don't have Especially their resources. Especially probably in Indianapolis. Exactly. It's a big city. They don't have the resources they need. So these caseworkers are taking on way more cases than than somebody truly should be. And so that all results in failures to these to the most innocent, vulnerable population, uh, which is our children. And and we see it time and time again. And and I I wish there would be some kind of reform in that system, but. The way it currently is, yeah, there's definitely failures. But right. like I said, I, I hate to, to cast all the blame on these caseworkers who really do have an extremely difficult job that they do not get paid enough for and ex- you know, extremely high caseloads. They're, they're just trying to juggle all this. And it's not an excuse by any means for children to be abused or, you know, killed. Yeah. Well, it's not, you know, but and, and... it is what it is. Yes, and I will give the ex- an, an example. Um, you know, I could think of a couple instances where, at least from my personal experience working in the job that I do, working with children or for children, and children, you know, victims of abuse or neglect, I have come across DHS workers who will, you know, they will be very vocal about their belief that I need to charge someone with a criminal offense, where... I'm looking at it through a criminal offense lens and it, you know, the act may not meet the elements of the crime. And so I can't charge them because no crime has been committed. And sometimes I have to have those conversations like, Hey, I know you don't agree with this parenting, whatever, you know, this situation. Um, but I still have to be unbiased. I have to find the facts. And if the facts lead to a law violation, and there is, you know, that it's supported by the elements of that crime, then yes, probable cause exists. And yeah, absolutely. They need to be criminally charged, but sometimes it doesn't rise to that level. So I say that because I do believe that most of the people who get into child protective services are in it for the right reason, which is to protect kids. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, and, and another thing on that too, is you kind of have to put yourself in that caseworker's shoes and, I'm sure, well, I know you see a lot of kids are used as pawns sometimes by parents that are going through divorce. Like yep. And we'll talk about battle. that. Here okay. In a so I don't want to jump the gun, but that's another issue that needs to be brought up is sometimes parents use their kids against each other when they're going through these custody yeah. battles and it's not fair for well, anyone. Yeah. Hold that thought because I want to talk about this for a minute. So in February of 2017, Haley made an allegation that Anthony pulled Nakota down the stairs, leaving bruises on Nakota. In November of 2017, Haley made another allegation that Anthony hit Nakota in the face, causing Nakota Nakota to fall over backwards over a couch. Then in June of 2018, Haley said Anthony threatened to beat her. And at some point, um, she claims that Anthony administered um, an overdose um, of ADHD medicine to Nakota. So those are, those are kind of what I found of the allegations. Um, also she said that she saw light bruising on him when he came to her house from Anthony's. So I'm just going to say real quick, just because you see light bruising on a child does not mean that child is abused. Sure. I have seen instances where children fall down at a playground and they get a bruise. If you have kids you find bruises on your kids that are unexplainable because kids are just kids, mm-hmm. and that happens. I mean, if you think about our our daughter in, in softball last year got hit with a – she wasn't wearing her mask. The one time she wasn't wearing her protective mask, and she gets knocked in the face with a softball and had a huge right. fat lip for days. And so as a result – I don't think we're terrible parents because she wasn't wearing her mask that we bought her. No, right? we, we so told her those to. Those things happen. <laughs> um, so – Essentially what happened is the Department of Child Services concluded there were no significant injuries such as broken bones, pattern bruising. You know, that's something that you would look at. Light bruising is different than pattern bruising. Pattern bruising, what I mean by that is like a belt buckle mark. Hmm. Um, You know, a significant handprint from strangulation or, you know, striking. Something that leaves a pattern like a wire hanger or a switch. You know, if you're listening to this and you're born, you know, in Generation X, you probably were hit with a switch, and that wasn't child abuse then. It probably would be now Mm -hmm. if you leave a pattern bruise. 
But anyway, anything that had a, you know, a significant injury would probably prompt a, a, burns. a different response. Cigarette yeah, burns. burns. There you I've go. I've seen that before. Yeah. Either way, nothing in these, according to Department of uh, Child Services, nothing in these reports rose to that level where they thought they had to intervene to restrict Anthony's parenting time. Um, so as a result, as you can imagine, those claims were unfounded. Um, in addition to n- denying the abuse, um, you know, cause he did, Anthony said the only reason Haley was making a complaint against him was to restrict his parenting time and to push Anthony out of Nakota's life. And so that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. You, you know, doing special victims unit casework, any special victims unit detective that's listening they will absolutely agree that you will see bogus complaints when people go through divorce. Absolutely. When they have a child custody dispute. Mm -hmm. Now you still have to treat those cases as if they happened and you have, you know, here's a lesson learned. If you haven't watched the documentary on Netflix called American nightmare, you, you know, as a detective, we're trained a little bit different than probably, you know, people who haven't had investigations experience and a good lesson to live by. And this is my advice. I've been doing law enforcement for over 20 years. I have a very extensive amount of experience in investigations and my advice to any detective who has, you know, is getting into investigations. And I think any seasoned detective would agree with me. You believe your victim until the evidence and the investigation reveals that they are not to be believed. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. Like don't do not do not ever ever doubt a victim or tell them that you don't believe their what they're telling you until you have hard evidence that says otherwise. Correct. And having said that though, when you get those cases where there is a recent divorce or a new motion to restrict parenting time or a custody dispute or, you know, child, child support, whatever it is, you, sh- you still need to always keep that in the forefront of your mind that, hey, is this the motive that this person is filing this complaint? Yeah, I mean, we could go on for, we could do several episodes on parental alienation and kids being used again, you know, to pit one parents against the other, we could go on forever. Yeah, and, it happens. And you know what? At the time, you know, when, when that happens, if you were the parent that did that or has done that, um, you know, a lot of times I think that you always think that you're doing the right thing, right? Because yeah. you want, you think that you're the better parent all the time. When mm-hmm. you're separated, you always think that the kid is better in your house because you can parent them and watch them and care for them. And you don't know what's happening in the other parent's house. Mm -hmm. The important thing to take away from this is you, when you co-parent, you have to trust that other parent to make adult decisions that is in the best benefit and welfare of the child. And that's what the, that's what the court does. They put that back on you when they split that custody. Mm -hmm. And also that's what, you know, child protective services do. In this case, because they unfounded it, unfounded it, they basically put it back on uh, Anthony in this case and said, you know what? He said it's an accident for the you know overdose of ADHD medication. We have to probably take his word for it or give him some sort of leniency on that. And we have to be able to put that back on him to say, hey, you know what? You are, you're a dad. Grow up. You're responsible. And so some of that burden has to lay land on both parents. It, it absolutely does. Like... Once you have, you know, once once the government or other people have to get involved, they're coming at it from outside. They don't know you personally. They don't know your home situation. I think in general terms, all of those people really are and really do get into this line of work to do good. And they're doing the best they can. In most cases, I'm not saying in every case, there are things that happen and there are failures. I get that. But in a general sense, I really do think they come in trying their very best, just like investigators do, just like people from the outside. All we can do is our very best to to make, you know, make the situation right. Be that, good that, people. That, that's all we can do. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have crystal balls and we can't see what's going on. And and we just have the information that's available to us. And we do what we, we're human. We make mistakes and we make bad decisions and 
we, we can only do as as good a job as we can. That's or, that's it. We're not yes. perfect. And as a disclaimer, I'm talking about reasonable people. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's some stuff obviously that's going on with Anthony where I don't consider him a reasonable person. Sure. And we'll talk about that. Um, and so on July 17th of 2020, 10 year old Nakota, so he's 10 years old at this time, he was scheduled to go to Anthony's house for his weekend and in, 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 in Indianapolis. That was hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> he was scheduled to go to Anthony's house in Indianapolis. There you go. Yeah. But. Nakota wanted to play his final baseball game with his little league team. So apparently Nakota was really, really good at baseball. He loved doing it. And, um, you know, they erected a plaque and they gave him a famous Aww. baseball wow. um, name, you know, nickname and everything. Um, but anyway, you know, it just, it's so sad because you could just picture your own 10 year old child really wanting to play the last game because now he's got to wait a whole nother season to play baseball and it's so much fun to play with your team and that's all he wanted to do mm -hmm. and so you know what um his mom let him you know and she's like hey you know you're supposed to go with your dad but your dad can wait you i'm gonna let you play this last softball game i have to 100 percent say like my daughter lives for softball that she is super passionate about it loves every minute of it and i love every minute of watching her so i mean i would do the same thing <laughs> yeah. like so, i'm so sorry yeah this and you is know happening what? but you know here's the text messages and um haley provided these to a local news agency so um this will be in our source material and you'll be able to see this if you just click through the links to find these text messages but here's what she said so okay so even though it was going to make Nakota late for the custody exchange. And she, she, you know, she's allowing him to play this baseball game and this made Anthony mad. And so this is the partial te No, we don't have the full text message conversation. This is just a partial. So in the text message conversation, Anthony says, quote, if I don't get my son today, I will take necessary actions, including involving the police. Okay. Haley responds by a with a text by saying, quote, we will, 9.30, after Nakota's game, you are more than welcome to attend. Oh, so she's inviting him to the game. So she's inviting him, to, him to see his son's game. He then responds by saying, court order is at 6 p.m. If I don't see my son at 6 p.m., I will call the police and my lawyer will file a citation against you. So he's, you know, a lot of people will say or think, people will think, oh, my God, he's threatening me. Well, no, this is no. not a threat. When there's a condition attached to something it's you don't typically have a threat right you know if if i tell you hey if you come to my house i will kill you that's not a threat there's a condition on it if you step foot in my house i will shoot you that's not a threat that's just a warning there's a difference mm. so there's a condition on this with him and i'm not taking his side i'm just saying this isn't really too concerning for me he's saying i will Call the police. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You're. Vi you're gonna be in violation of the court right. order. No, I. I mean, it's I, being difficult. I, yes, exactly. I see that. Not. Yeah. I, I, personally, I wouldn't be too concerned about that either. It sounds like somebody who's upset. She. She's gonna violate this court order that's in place by a few hours, and he wants to be difficult because he's angry. Correct. With her. So there's two two things here. Number one, and this is unpopular. He's right. No, he, he, he is, He has a custody time, and she needs to abide by it. Yep. But she's not necessarily wrong because she is telling him, hey, come to the game. She's violating the court order for what she believes to be a good reason mm -hmm. and what Nakota definitely probably feels to be a good reason. Sure, absolutely. Anthony yeah. clearly doesn't feel that way. So this is one of those situations where when you have a court order, if the custody you know, agreement says you will meet at six o'clock, then you meet at six o'clock unless both parties agree mm -hmm. and you can both agree. And you know, how hard would it be? I don't know what Anthony's plans were. Maybe he had plans, you know, for dinner, whatever, who knows? But if he didn't have anything going on, would it really hurt him to say, you know what? I'd love to come see my son play the last baseball game of the season. Yeah. No. So it's, ju it's just a little bit of give and take. Anyway, what happened was Nakota played his last little league game before going to his dad's house in Indianapolis. So this is the scary thing, the sad thing, really. Before Nakota left, he told Haley, 
Don't expect me to come home. My dad's going to kill me. Oh my gosh. Why why would a 10-year-old say that? I mean, obviously there's some so huge issue there. My opinion is he, that Nakota said that probably because he knows his dad has anger issues. He knows his dad's going to be mad. And how many times as a child, if you stayed out past curfew, I'm just, I'm just being reasonable here. How many times when you stayed out past curfew or you did something you weren't supposed to do? Like, you know what? If you're a teenager and say you drank when you weren't supposed to and now you know your parents are going to find out, how many times has you, have you said, oh, my God, my, my parents are going to kill me? Oh, yeah, you hear you that know, all the time. Maybe he didn't te- you know, technically you know, really mean that literally. Could be, but his statement of, well, don't expect me to don't come home, that's a little extreme. That is extreme. He's so, a 10-year-old. So Either way, it does become important. So what what I think it does is it definitely speaks to the experience he has had with his dad, his knowledge of his dad's behavior, whether it's his short temper or, you know, how he's going to be treated. Maybe these light bruises are, uh, you know, the result of being abused, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. Who, Who knows? But either way, this is what he said to his mom. So what happened? Well... Anthony killed Nakota. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. And how did we find this out? So Anthony called his uh, family member on the 18th. So the next day, um, it was a Saturday, July 18th. So he called a family member who was in Texas screaming into the phone that he had just killed Nakota. He said, you know, I just killed my son. So that family member contacted the police who responded to the address to conduct a welfare check. When police arrived, They heard someone moving inside, but officers determined they didn't have reason to force entry, so they left. Okay, well, I disagree with that. I would say that... I wholeheartedly disagree with that. If you have somebody saying, hey, he just called me frantic, screaming that he killed his son, I now call you to the residence, you go, you knock on the door, you hear something going on inside, so you know somebody is there... And, and they're then not you, coming to the door? Yes. And then you just say, oh, well, we don't have... No. There's yeah, something so, called exigent circumstances. Correct. And that's, what, and that's what they had. And you know what? I, we can, you know, armchair quarterback this all day long. Whatever decision they made, they have to live with it. I, I'm not going to, you know, disparage them too much. But here, here's what we do know. Exigent circumstances, when those exist, you can... They could have forced entry. In, in certain situations, right? Mm-hmm. In order to protect life, in order to prevent evidence from being destroyed, in order to prevent an escape. And the other exigent circumstances when you have a fleeing suspect and you're in what some people call it hot pursuit, but it's it's actually referred to in the in the courts as fresh pursuit. The difference is, you know, if um, I'm chasing a suspect and I lose sight of that suspect and I just think he went into, you know, a red door, I don't, I can't really kick that door in because I don't know for sure that he went in there. But right. if I actually witnessed him open that red door and enter and close it behind him, then I can, I can go ahead and force entry to continue my pursuit. Mm-hmm. That doesn't apply here, but they did have an exigency to force entry to hopefully maybe they could have probably not. I mean, he said he killed Nakota, but you know, could he have still been alive and been saved? I don't know. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, well, unfortunately, we'll never know. know, But in my opinion, and and I wasn't there, and I, you know, I'm just going off the information that I have now. I would say there were exigent circumstances. There were a hundred percent exigent. Well, you have to, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know if he's alive or dead, right? But you know something serious happened, Mm -hmm. and you can hear someone, and you can hear someone inside. So you have the preservation of life Mm -hmm. exigent circumstance, and then you have a you know, the possibility of destruction Destruction. of evidence. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, on July 19th, and this is kind of learned afterwards, uh, detectives learned that there was security surveillance cameras in the area that captured Anthony's white Jeep. That's what he drove, leaving the apartment and returning to the apartment complex several times between the hours of 2.27 a.m. and 7.44 a.m. Wow. So So that was the next day. On Sunday, yeah. Okay. At 8.30 a.m., Anthony was seen on the surveillance cameras making three different trips from his apartment to his Jeep, loading something into the back of the Jeep. Mm. During the second 
trip to his Jeep, Anthony was seen throwing something into a gar uh, garbage bin. And in addition to the video surveillance, so this was, you know, the last thing, you know, the trips to the car was at 830. So he's active from 230 at least that they know of until 830. At 1143 in the morning, a friend of Anthony's called the police department and made a report stating Anthony borrowed a suitcase from him and also admitted to the friend to killing Nakota. Mm. So this is the second admission Mm -hmm. to to a separate party that he's killed his son. Mm. So, in fact, this friend is the only person to provide details of Nakota's death to detectives. So he, to he said, he reported that Anthony said he used a bag to suffocate Nakota until Nakota stopped breathing. Mm. Sad. Jeez, that makes me really sad. It is really sad because, you know, despite dad's anger issues we you know some people have some pretty harsh parents growing up but this is still somebody who you should trust mm -hmm. as the person to protect you not to suffocate you with a plastic you know piece of plastic sure and yeah you have anger issues but i mean you're you're angry you're angry at Haley, you're not angry at Nakota. He's the child in this situation. Well, unfortunately, sure. you know, it's very possible that he wanted to cause Haley extreme anguish and, and trauma by, and in that had to take his own son's life to do it. It's terrible. Yeah. It's absolutely horrible. Well, in addition to telling this friend that he suffocated Nakota with a plastic bag, Anthony said he took Nakota to the bathroom to make sure Nakota was dead. Mm. and he had since dumped Nakota's body. After Anthony made his confession to the friend, the friend told Anthony that he was going to call 911 and Anthony needed to return home, but Anthony told him that he was out of state and on his way back to Indianapolis, so he had already left. Wow. So he probably dumped his body well, outside of Yeah, the I kind of I kind of think two things could have happened. If he's leaving between 227 and, you know, 7 whatever in the morning, is it possible that he chopped up, you know, Nakota's body and dumped him in various garbage bins? Mm -hmm. That that could that could be. Yeah. Um, did he dump him somewhere along the road when he was, you know, out of state or whatever? Yeah, maybe. Who knows? After Anthony's friend made this report, police returned to the apartment, and this time they used that exigent circumstance to enter the apartment. So they got a key from the property manager, and when they entered, Anthony. Anthony and Nakota were gone. Yeah. However, police noticed blood, like a blood smear in the bathroom, um, hair and brain matter inside the apartment. Mm. So, so if he suffocated him, why is there so much blood and brain matter? Well, according to Anthony, he dismembered his body oh, okay. afterwards after he suffocated him. Okay. So who knows? The problem is, you know, it's no surprise. I think you know where I'm going with this. Anthony's, or I mean, sorry, Nakota's body has never been found. Mm. Um, so, so they don't know. They don't have a autopsy. They don't have like a, you know, a forensic report of the cause of death or anything. They just have to, they go just off have this statement. What Anthony says. Yeah, exactly. So later after Anthony's arrest and during the court process, Anthony's attorneys argued that this search was illegal and therefore should be suppressed. But prosecutors argued that exigent circumstance you know that 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 existed yeah to believe that nakota was either deceased inside the apartment or in need of medical attention absolutely they and have right. two different confessions to two different people who called the police saying hey this he called and said that he killed his son that's absolutely a legitimate reason to go in and well do what you need yeah to do. and the defense lost that motion. Of I mean, course they did. You know, of course, the, the court ruled that the search was good. And so what happens, you know, when that when, when you have a situation like this? And I, I'm assuming. I didn't read all the court paperwork. But what, what would typically happen is once you enter in those exigent circumstances and you see evidence of a crime, you are then, as a law enforcement officer, able to secure that as a crime scene. You back out. You write your warrants so that everything is on the up and up. For the court process. Of course. You're you get still that judge's signature. Protecting that which scene. Is, Nobody's going in or out, and you yeah. have a court order saying you can go in there. That That right. is the way to do that. I, 100%. <laughs> I won't even get into that. I've been argued with on that before, and that's just no, it, silly. It is, if yeah. you have time, 
to get a warrant always get a warrant if you, you have if the time is there do do it the right, right. way other right? than like the fresh pursuit thing I exactly mean, there's not a lot of situations where you don't have time to get it, a warrant it, yeah, absolutely it lo- it literally should take you should if you're a decent detective you should be able to write any kind of warrant mm-hmm. in the matter of an hour with minimal facts and have an affidavit before the court and approved to be able to do something like this. Anyway, I don't want to get off topic. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so do you remember I told you that Anthony's friend contacted the police at 11.43 in the morning? Yes. Well, later that day at about 2 p.m., Anthony sent a text message to Haley which read, and I quote, Sometimes I hear voices. My son is in heaven. Oh my gosh, so she didn't even... I mean... The police have already come and found blood and brain matter, and poor Haley is over in Wabash or Wabash and has no idea that anything is wrong with her son. Well, probably not. I mean, not until she gets this I text know. message At from 2 Anthony, PM, correct? After all of this is done, that's so, terrible. Yeah, and as it turns out, and in my humble opinion, I think that this text message was the beginning of Anthony's defense. Right, because he's hearing voices. Correct. So anyway, and I'll talk about his defense here in a second. But during the course of the investigation, detectives tracked Anthony's movements based on his cell phone geolocation data. Anthony drove through Indiana, through Illinois, and through Missouri. Oh, wow. Right. He, so at about 4 p.m. and about 375 miles from the apartment, a Missouri Highway Patrolman stopped Anthony in Macon, Macon County. Macon. Macon County. It sounds like Bacon County. Yeah. I would love to live in Bacon County, side note. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Anyway, inside the Jeep, so they arrested him, but inside the Jeep, detectives found bloodstains, but no sign of Nakoda. Uh Anthony was arrested, but he never participated in an interview with detectives. So all the information that they have is based on probably DNA evidence found inside, you know, the brain matter. Sure. The blood. They, the, the confessions, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to get a murder conviction without a body, Mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. It does happen. This is a great case for a bodiless homicide conviction. Yeah. Cause you have, you know, his confessions to two different people, three different people now, because he's telling Haley that her son is in heaven. Um, and then you have all of the, the blood evidence and then you have his cell phone evidence of what, you know, he's traveling through all of these states, you know, for yeah, no other reason, really. He's got blood in well, his Jeep. I mean... Nefarious reasons. Right. No other reason, but let's be honest. They're nefarious reasons. He's sure. escaping. He's eluding. He's probably dumping evidence. Yep. So in 2023, September of 2023, Anthony pled guilty but mentally ill. So what that basically means is though, um, although Anthony claims to be mentally ill... He still understands what he was doing. Uh, You know, he understands right from wrong, and he understood what he was doing. Of course, he did because he went and he's his body's never been found. So when somebody goes through the effort, as he says, he dismembered the body. It's because you know what you did was wrong. Correct, and and this plea is a little bit different than you know, guilty by reason of insanity. This is a guilty plea, but mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So. He's he's basically saying my mental illness is the cause for this, but I do understand what I did was wrong. Clearly he does mm-hmm. because he went through extraordinary steps to cover his tracks and to flee. So he right. knew right from wrong. And so I'm guessing his attorney understood that and sure. probably said, you, this isn't going to fly. You can't plead guilty by reason of insanity. So I think that that message to... Uh, Haley saying, I hear voices. Mm-hmm. That was the beginning of his defense because he wanted to start early on. He didn't know what else to do. Right. He called his family member in Texas frantic mm-hmm. saying that he killed his son. He's, you know, definitely in a panic. Borrowing a suitcase Borrowing from a, a friend. Suitcase. I mean, because, and, and obviously you probably don't know this. I'm sure it's not out there, but it doesn't sound like he's ever had issues with hearing voices in the past or having these I, mental you know health issues. There's but... nothing in any of the research that I've done mm-hmm. that indicates he has a past history of mental illness, but you know, Haley has made several complaints about his mental health in so much as that he has a anger issue. Right. So 
Obviously, we did a little bit of a different case. We had we gave you some closure. Mysteries and mimosas should be about mysteries, and this still has a mystery. We don't know where Nakota is, um, but we did give you some resolution on what happened to Nakota, and and the unfortunate thing is the person who Nakota probably trusted the most, or one of the people that he trusted the most, did that something he should very tr- be able to trust the most. Yeah, did something very horrific to him in October of 2023. Anthony was sentenced to 52 years in prison for Nakota's homicide, but Nakota's remains have never been found. If you have any information that you'd like to share regarding the location of Nakota, please contact the Indianapolis Police uh, Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department at 317-327-6160. This is a sad case. Yeah, it's it's really sad to see the most vulnerable and innocent, you know, people in our population be victimized that way. The, some, just a little boy who wanted nothing more in life to play than baseball, just to play baseball I and know. be loved, and just be happy. And he deserved that. He kids, absolutely kids did. always deserve that. And so, it's evil. It's evil what he did. That's the the only thing I can say. It's just one hundred percent. Yes, I you know. You have to kind of sometimes, I think, be careful what you say on a podcast. But our podcast is, you know, always, you know, based on research that we do and our opinions that we give. And I am definitely comfortable saying my opinion is that Anthony's a scumbag. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. He is the, the worst of the worst. He violated that little boy's trust. He definitely took advantage of people his entire life. And I think he's exactly where he needs to be right now. And hopefully that's where he stays for the rest of his life. That's my opinion. And I think it's pretty um, a pretty popular opinion. I'm sure Anyway, it is. we'd like to know what you think, so please reach out to us. Contact us on our website at mysteriesandmimosas.net. Also, please follow us on Instagram at mysteriesandmimosaspodcast. Do you have anything you'd like to say? No. No? Okay. Well... Don't you have something to say? No. Are you sure? I'm sure. It seems like you have something you'd like to say. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Okay. I Did you just like lip mouth over to me? Put a fork in it? This episode is done, son? <laughs> no, that's definitely I, didn't say that's that. That's what it looked like you were saying. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, well. Nobody out there that's listening believes a word of that. I would never say that. You know, I don't know why you're still talking when you said that this episode is done, son. Cheers. Cheers.